business. Unfortunately, um, so first of all, there is the, um, so the societal view of autism to begin with, the, the limited resources sets everyone up for, you know, a, a false scarcity that shouldn't be there. Um, in, in, you know, and then there's the autism industrial complex where they're, they know, often autism is big business. It's profitable. It's a lot, it's profitable to have multiple, you know, various services and to scare parents to pay for even more beyond what the insurance will, is providing beyond what the school district is providing. Um, there is the lack of education that parents are given. Like when I mentioned that parents are gaslit, parents are gaslit. The tip, a parent may not share their child's neurology. But they know, okay, I don't really understand why my kid does thing, this thing or this thing, but that thing brings my child joy. Um, it's not hurting anybody. It's kind of weird. But then the professionals come in and say, no, you're a bad parent. You're for allowing them to do this. You've got to stop this. You've got to nip this in the bud. You have to make them do this. You have to make them do that. You know, so your natural parental instinct, which again, you may not understand why, because it's not your neurology, but you know that this calms your child down, or you know this is their way of expressing something. You are told to ignore that in favor of, of you know, doing something else. And I don't know if any of you have ever Googled that. Um, there's this, this video where it talks about um, parents. Um, it, there's parents and babies, and these are typical babies, typically developing non-autistic babies, um, or at least believed to be. Um, where the parent, it's like in a, where the child is doing something and trying to get the parent's attention and the parent is pretending not to notice the child's there at all. So this isn't like a situation where it's parallel play, where this is a situation where the child is used to joint attention and joint interaction. And the, and the parent's not making a mean face or being rude or yelling or screaming. They're just kind of blank, just kind of, you know, checked out, like, you know, planned ignoring. And the distress that you see um, on the, these children's faces and the way that it impacts them. And there's also some research that has taken, um, you know, that's looked at their heart rate and all of these other things and how much, how, how much trauma that caused in just that, that few moments. And then right the after- cortisol levels just go through yes. the roof. And yes, yes. And it takes a long time to regulate. And this is just for something that was done momentarily. Imagine this is what parents are told to do to their children all the time, mm -hmm. all day, yeah. every day, seven days a week until they get better, which may better meaning non-autistic, which they'll never get. That's, so that's disturbing for the parent. That's disturbing for the child. It destroys the bond. It, um, allow, it doesn't allow you to see the child, that, the beautiful child that's right in front of you. Instead, you see this broken human being that you have to fix. Um, you spend your money um, on things that, so instead of your child having a life, 75% um, of um, special needs you know, or disabled um, school age youth have no activities that they do out, this is before the pandemic, I, the number's probably higher now, outside of therapies. So outside of OT, PT, speech therapy, or ABA, they do literally nothing. They don't do um, extracurricular clubs. They don't do art. They don't do go have fun and just, they, do, they don't do anything because their parents don't have any time because they're told to spend their life <laughs> or money because they're told to spend it all, you know, get a second mortgage on your house to pay for this, this person or this special diet. The child is told the words that are, you're diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. The, the name itself is stigmatizing. Um, when you look at the diagnostic criteria and the way that it's worded, there's a, a document um, that I, I hand out to people sometimes. I, I based it off of, there's a woman named Brenda Rothman who used to uh, write uh, Mama Be Good, has an autistic teen. And um, she broke down the DSM-4 and then parts of five, the, like the terminology. And I, I highlighted like the, the areas where it's using stigmatizing language versus objective. Um, so the child is told that there's something wrong with you, not different, but wrong, mm. um, and is shown by the world that something is wrong with you and, and, is, and becomes self-conscious because of that. Um, so there's all those factors. Then there's the factor that the um, you know, early intervention services um, are variable from, state, from location to location in terms of their quality, in terms of also the quantity. Um, and the, you have an individualized service fam uh, right. family plan but after that, by the time your child turns three and you're in the, the school district, this is an unfunded mandate, you know, for um, the IDEA. So a lot of schools basically, you know, if you're not going to fight and be that parent, and even if you are, <laughs> <laughs> then um, it's not likely to, you're not likely to get the services that you need. Um, most, there's, there's minimal, edu you know, most general education um, teachers have minimal understanding of how to um, uh, properly address the needs of autistic youth. Um, AAC, um, Technology and understanding is 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 eons behind what it should be, if at all. Um, students have segregated education. 
um, a, a great deal of the time um, that's in mo multiple levels, aren't given um, extended, um, you know, extended um, end of year um, services for financial reasons. Um, wait lists for services are, are years long. Um, it, it's just, I mean, there's just, it's just a huge amount of things that, um, you know, that create these problems. And that's not even talking about things like other factors a family might have, like other children and those needs or educational attainment or financial difficulties or being in an area where maybe, you know, geographically there are limited services or, um, you know, insurance caps that only say X amount of, of, you know, occupational therapy sessions this year, no matter how many your child needs um, or living in a, a you know, in being in a school district where you're not going to get where, you know, the services where they own, they, they have, you know, poorly integrated, um, you know, s services and your child's not mainstreamed. Like these are, these are just this, that's just these baseline things. I haven't talked about crime rate. I haven't talked about health. I haven't talked about any of that <laughs> yet. Just those basic things that I've shared set a child up for failure. There's a reason why the life expectancy of autistic people is in the 30s. And so because of, you know, not just suicide, but also accidents, um, the poor health outcomes that we have, the lower um, home, owner, home ownership and, um, you know, chronic poverty and, you know, you know, uh, instable, you know, home, you know, all of that, you know, being constantly homeless or at risk of homelessness. Okay.